Hi, welcome to Thursdays at 4. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements before uh, we get going on our main attraction. So next week, Thursdays at 4, will be Professor Paul Shackle from the Anthropology Department at the University of Maryland, and he'll be talking about engaging communities in the heartland and archaeology of a multiracial community. All the things I'm about to tell you, you can find more information about on the IAS website, which is the ever-difficult IAS.umn.edu. Okay. <laughs> IAS Residential Fellow applications are going to be due October 23rd, and there's more information on the IAS website. Uh, the bookstore is here selling copies of uh, Professor Kelman's uh, two most recent books, and he is willing to sign them for you in this room after his talk this afternoon if you um, are interested. Okay, so... Today's talk, A Misplaced Massacre, Struggling Over the Memory of Sand Creek, is co-sponsored by many units on campus, the Department of American Indian Studies, American Studies, Chicano and Latino Studies, the Department of Anth Departments of Anthropology and History, and the Race, Indigeneity, Gender, and Sexuality Studies Initiative. So many groups came together to make this possible, and we're grateful for, it, for their support. I get to introduce the introducer, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jean O'Brien, who is a professor in the history department and, American, and the former chair, recently liberated, of American <laughs> Indian Studies here at the University of Minnesota. Her most recent book, which is just one of many, many, many publications, is a co-edited edited volume why You Can't Teach U.S. History Without Indians, just out this year from the University of North Carolina Press. She's also the founding co-editor of the journal Native American and Indigenous Studies. So without further ado. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. So um, without further ado, um, thank you all for being here. This is a great turnout on a beautiful day. So we have a lovely room now at least, right? Um, Eric Kelman is McCabe Greer Professor of History at Penn State University, where he teaches a wide range of courses, including Civil War and Reconstruction, the Politics of Memory, Environmental History, Native American History, and America in the 1960s. He's the author, most recently, of Battle Lines, A Graphic History of the Civil War, 2015, which he earlier described as a comic book. It most decidedly is not. It's an amazing... It's not pejorative to call something a comic book. No, it is a graphic history of the Civil War. It's really amazing. You should have a look at it. It's for sale outside. And Professor Coleman will sign it for you. Um, as well as Misplaced Massacre, Struggling Over the Memory of Sand Creek 2013, which I'll talk about today. Misplaced Massacre is the winner of numerous awards, as many of you know, namely the Antoinette Forrester Downing Book Award, the Avery O'Craven uh, Award, the Bancroft Prize, which is a biggie for us in our profession in history, in history the Tom Watson Book, um, Brown Book Award, and the Robert M. Utley Prize from the Western History Association. He is also the author of A River and Its City, which we are one of those too. We are looking at the river today, we'll hopefully look some more at the river. Um, the Nature of Landscape in New Orleans 2003, which won the Abbott Bowl Cummings Prize. Kelman's essays and articles have appeared in many venues, including Slate, The Christian Science Monitor, The Nation, The Times Literary Supplement, The Journal of Urban History, The Journal of American History, and many other publications. Kelman has also, has also contributed to outreach endeavor, endeavors aimed at K-12 educators and to a variety of public history projects, including documentary films for the History Channel and PBS's American Experience series. He has received numerous grants and fellowships, most notably from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Huntington Library, going next year to the Huntington. He is now working on a book tentatively titled For Liberty and Enterprise, How the Civil War Bled into the Indian Wars. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kelman. Uh, first of all, thanks, Jeannie, um, for the invitation uh, to come out. Um, I don't know 
I always wonder if people who are part of a community have a sense of how that community is perceived elsewhere. Uh, I want to tell you that when I received the invitation to come here, it was really kind of extraordinary for me because I think of this as being the center of, of Native American and Indigenous studies right now in the United States. I think of the community of which all of you are a part uh, as being the most vibrant intellectual community working on these sorts of issues. And so it's really a very, very special pleasure uh, to be here. Um, and I also want to thank you, as Jeannie just said, for showing up on a beautiful sunny day. I don't know what you're doing here. Um, <laughs> I will try not to disappoint, um, but I inevitably, uh, anything I do will pale in comparison to this extraordinary weather. I was just saying a moment ago that I am having landscape and campus envy uh, all day long today. Um, Having said all of that, I want to, one final thing. Uh, if at any point during the talk you want to interrupt me, please feel free to go ahead. I'm sure there'll be Q&A afterward. I say that, okay, there will be Q&A afterward, but you're welcome to stop me if you want anything clarified. I'm actually gonna do this more formally than I normally uh, lecture, and the reason that I'm doing that is, is the nature of the topic. Some of you know me, I think. I have a tendency to be very glib, uh, and I go off script a lot, and this is not a topic that lends itself to glibness, and so I, I've actually found that it's a lot easier for me if I'm a bit more formal. Having said that, I don't really have a train of thought for you to derail, so do feel free to let me know if, if I'm being confusing or if you want me to flesh something out as, as I'm going along. So with all of that said, uh, as, as many of you may know, on November 29th, 1864, something like 700 or so troops from the 1st and 3rd Colorado regiments, these were soldiers who were led by a man named John Shivington, a colonel in the United States Army. This is actually a very important point. This was not Colorado militia. These were federal forces on the federal payroll. Uh, so the 700 troops led by John Shivington attacked an encampment of Arapahoes and Cheyennes nestled in a bend of Sand Creek uh, in what then was southeastern Colorado Territory. And you can see where the Sand Creek uh, massacre site is there, relatively close to the Kansas border. Um, some 900 to maybe as many as 1,100 Native people, uh, all of whom believed that they had recently made peace with white authorities in Colorado. Uh, these Native people fled up what at that time of year is almost always a dry creek bed. It was dry that day. By the end of the day, 175 of them were dead the overwhelming majority of whom were women, children, or the very elderly. Shivington's troops disgraced themselves in the aftermath of the fight as they did during it. They combed the field for what one of them described as, quote, trophies, end quote. These were the scalps and fingers and genitalia of their victims. These soldiers then burned what remained of this village, then they returned to Denver, where for a variety of different reasons, they were greeted as heroes. And in the weeks after Sand Creek, Shivington's men exhibited the plunder that they had taken from this killing field at a downtown theater. It became a kind of curiosity uh, and something of a tourist attraction. Nearly a century and a half later, on April 28, 2007, the National Park Service opened its 391st unit, as you can see here, the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site. The ceremony on that day was both a celebration and a memorial service. After drum groups went quiet, uh, a Cheyenne chief began the event with an invocation, then members of the United States Congress, Colorado's governor at the time, leaders from four Native American tribes, local politicians, and finally NPS officials, that's Mary Bomar, uh, NPS officials, all of these people, over the course of about three and a half hours, they shared their vision for what this site might mean. I was there that day, it was very hot and very windy, and everyone in the audience except me was miserable. I sat there taking notes avidly, fascinated by what they were saying as everyone around me turned into raisins. Um, 
Initially, the speakers at this opening ceremony struck what was a surprisingly optimistic pose. They said that this site honored the memory of Sand Creek's victims. In this way, they suggested that it promised long-deferred healing. They used that word again and again and again. Long-deferred healing to the affected tribes. And finally, a number of them suggested that this offered a blueprint for future cooperation between native peoples and federal authorities. The idea was that if you situated collective remembrance in a sufficiently sacred place, you could possibly seal a rift that had been cut by violence between cultures. Taking a step back for a moment uh, from that ceremony, memorials are, as probably most of you know, always shaped by politics. Uh, which is to say that contemporary concerns inflect how the past gets presented at these sorts of places. Because memorial designers look both to history, but also to the present and the future when they do their work. This is probably especially true of national historic sites, because federal officials have for a very long time looked at public commemoration as a kind of patriotic alchemy a way of conjuring unity from divisiveness by appealing to what they hope will be shared perceptions of the past. And so historic sites around the United States typically evince a uh, kind of an abiding faith in the nationalizing power of public memory, public commemoration. These monuments are supposed to serve the nation's interests by linking together its diverse peoples, and also, and this is really critical, by legitimating federal authority. Out of common memories, the theory goes, Americans forge a common identity. Memories of Sand Creek speakers at this opening ceremony suggested, as I said a moment ago, would help not only heal these historic wounds or historic trauma, but also would help visitors to the site to transcend their own prejudices. People would feel better when they went to this site. The justification for collective remembrance in the United States in recent years, ranging from the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City to the 9-11 Memorial in Lower Manhattan, hurry up slide or slow down Ari, one or the other, um, these sorts of uh, initiatives have often rested on a similar promise, and that's to comfort stricken communities in a grieving nation. The Sand Creek site was supposed to be particularly good in this way because it would be the first unit in the national parks system that was going to label an event in which federal troops had killed native people, uh, label this sort of an event uh, a massacre. And in this way, it was going to have more utility. By remembering John Shivington's victims, uh, and also the country's history of racial violence, visitors again would supposedly be able to transcend their own prejudices they would be able to heal in this way. But, uh, as again, probably most of you know, Sand Creek is a very unlikely source for these sorts of utopian sentiments and for this sort of a palliative vision. And so, not surprisingly, dissenting voices, uh, first from Native people who had participated in the memorialization process, that's Eugene Little Coyote, who at the time was the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Chairman, uh, Native people began to suggest that actually uh, this memorial struck them as, as kind of a hollow offer of reconciliation that was being purchased on the cheap by the federal government. Uh, some of them went on to say that the Sand Creek Memorial seemed actually to be a kind of a stalking horse for uh, an older assimilationist project for the federal government's long-standing interest in stripping tribal peoples of their distinctive identities. And so, rather than accepting this site as a symbol of federal power, they suggested that it needed to be portrayed as an emblem of tribal persistence and self-determination. Then other participants at the ceremony began expressing their own suspicions about the memorial for their own reasons. Uh, because the federal government was and remains very unpopular on the eastern plains of Colorado, 
because the site embodied for some people who were there that day, including Marilyn Musgrave, who at the time was Eastern Colorado's congressional representative. These are Musgrave's words, quote, political correctness and gratuitive, excuse me, gratuitous revisionism, end quote. And then finally, there was a sense on the part of a number of people who were there that uh, the word massacre in the name of this site somehow indicted the United States military. You have to remember, uh, this was still relatively close to the 9-11 attacks. The United States was at the time involved in at least two wars overseas. And so there were a number of observers who were there that day who believed that a memorial that questioned the military's rectitude in any way necessarily flirted with anti-Americanism. For the next maybe half hour or so, what I'm going to try and do is suggest that the controversy in 2007 at the opening ceremony echoed about a century and a half's wrangling over how Sand Creek should be remembered. Wrangling that pivoted in many instances on thorny questions about the relationship between violence and politics on the American borderlands, and also on the relationship between the process of continental expansion and two or more wars, the United States Civil War and the so-called Plains Indian Wars, that were spawned by that process. In 2007 and in the years leading to that, when the site sponsors tried to answer these sorts of questions, they learned that Sand Creek remained a history front in an ongoing culture war. Collective remembrance, they discovered, could just as easily tear scabs from old wounds as help to heal them. And so while each new fight over American memory highlights the challenge of agreeing on a single historical narrative. Within the confines of a pluralistic society like the United States, the case of Sand Creek proved unusually complex. Because, as I'll say in a moment, as I'll explain in a moment, there were competing, sometimes even incommensurable stories of the massacre that ended up haunting this memorialization initiative. The first of those stories belonged to a Methodist minister and a staunch abolitionist named John Shivington. John Shivington saw the violence at Sand Creek as a noble part of civilizing the American West, his words, and also of preserving the Union during the Civil War. He actually saw those two processes as inextricably intertwined. And so he used the gallons of blood spilled along the banks of Sand Creek to, de to depict a masterstroke. On November 29, 1864, as Cheyenne and Arapaho corpses cooled near him, he bragged to his superior officer that his men, that Shivington's men, had attacked an Indian village, quote, bristling with more than a thousand warriors, end quote. He then went on to say that the fight, despite the long odds that his troops had faced, had gone very well. His men had killed several chiefs, he said, and hundreds, he claimed, hundreds of their followers. He concluded that dispatch by justifying the attack at Sand Creek. He pointed to depredations allegedly committed by the fallen enemy. His men, he said, had whipped, quote, savages, end quote, guilty of desecrating white bodies. For the remainder of his life, John Shivington pointed to Sand Creek Civil War context and also to the settlers' remains that he claimed his men had recovered there. In the spring of 1865, for example, he testified to federal investigators that, quote, rebel emissaries were sent among the Indians to incite them, end quote. Shivington then pointed back to the Dakota War in Minnesota and to the Cherokee's decision to fight with the Confederacy. He noted that in 1864, a Cheyenne warrior named George Bent, about whom I'll talk more in a moment, in 1864, he said George Bent had served as the Confederacy's agent. Bent had promised Colorado's native peoples that, quote, with the great father at Washington having all he could do to fight his children at the South, the Indians could regain their country, end quote. In this way, John Shivington made his victims at Sand Creek enemies not just of the West's white settlers, 
but of the Union more broadly. And the bloodshed then became not just a triumph in what was already being called the Indian Wars, but also of the United States Civil War. At the very end of his life in 1883, John Shivington was invited by a Colorado Heritage Organization to give the keynote at its annual banquet, and he spoke about Sand Creek. As far as I know, this is the last time he spoke about the massacre. He concluded his remarks, impassioned remarks, defending what had happened there by saying, quote, I stand by Sand Creek, end quote. So again, as far as I know, the last words that he uttered in public about what had happened there. Now, Captain Silas Sewell, seen here, did not stand by Sand Creek. Rather than remembering it, Sewell preferred to forget what had happened there. Prior to arriving in Colorado Territory four years before the massacre, Sewell had lived in Kansas, where he had allied himself with John Brown, earning a reputation as an abolitionist jayhawker. At Sand Creek, Sewell refused to commit the company of troops under him to the fight. He later wrote a letter to a friend of his, a man named Ned Winecoop, who's wearing an outstanding cape. Uh, <laughs> I thought about wearing a cape today and chose not to. Um, always a mistake. Uh, next time, when I come back. Uh, Sewell wrote to Winecoop, um, knowing that Ned Winecoop was very well connected. He knew that Winecoop had friends in Washington, D.C., in the War Department, and he hoped that Winecoop would pass along his letter to those friends, including the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. And he wrote to Winecoop, cataloging terrible cruelties that had been visited upon the dead at Sand Creek. Bodies of men, women, and children, he said, had been hacked apart. He depicted, in his words, civilized Indians and savage pioneers. This was a world that for him had been turned topsy-turvy. He wrote that Winecoop would, quote, think it impossible for white men to butcher and mutilate human beings as they did there, end quote. When Sewell testified before federal investigators looking into Sand Creek in the spring of 1865, investigations, I should note, that were spurred by his letter to Winecoop, Sewell in the spring of 1865 recounted how the previous summer he had arranged a meeting, a parley in Denver between peace chiefs, including Black Kettle, and Governor John Evans and Colonel John Shivington. At that meeting, Sewell remembered, Shivington had told the chiefs that if they wanted peace, if they wanted to be protected, they needed to come into Fort Lyon, a federal installation uh, in southeastern Colorado. If they did that, if they subjected themselves to military law, they would be, and these are Sewell's words, quote, under the protection of the United States flag. The Arapahoes and Cheyennes complied with that directive from Shivington. Sewell explained in his testimony that Black Kettle's people had, as a result of that, believed in the run-up to Sand Creek that they were being protected by federal troops. Silas Sewell's Sand Creek story took on added resonance when, on April 23, 1865, a soldier from the 2nd Colorado Cavalry murdered Sewell in the streets of Denver. The timing here matters. President Lincoln had been killed less than a week earlier, and Sewell's death, like Lincoln's, prompted a series of conspiracy theories, including the story that John Shivington had paid one of his former subordinates to murder Sewell. For some observers then, Silas Sewell's recollections of Sand Creek became unimpeachable. These were the memories of a man who had been martyred for speaking truth to power. Uh, one of the federal officials looking into Sand Creek at that time wrote, quote, the barbarism of slavery has culminated in the assassination of Mr. Lincoln. The barbarism of Sand Creek has culminated in the assassination of Captain Sewell. Three federal investigations eventually determined that Sand Creek had been a bad act. One went so far as to describe it as a massacre. But John Shivington and many other Western settlers refused to accept those findings. And so the fight over the memory of this event continued. In 1879, for example, 
author Helen Hunt Jackson, an advocate of what at the time was being called Indian reform, began writing letters to newspapers around the United States. Jackson drew on Silas Sewell's memories of Sand Creek. She noted that the native people there had been peaceful, that they'd been guaranteed protection by white authorities, and that John Shivington's men had desecrated the dead. Her charges rankled a number of different people, including this man, William Byers, who in 1864 had served as the editor of Denver's largest newspaper, the Rocky Mountain News. At that time, in the immediate aftermath of Sand Creek, Byers had dismissed claims that what had taken place there had been a massacre. And in 1879, he began to engage in a print war with Jackson, on the uh, letters pages of newspapers. He suggested that Sand Creek had actually pacified the Plains tribes, that what had taken place there had opened up the West to settlement, and then he noted that Jackson, who was originally from New England, and who also, of course, was a woman, possessed effete feminine sensibilities that were out of place in the rough and tumble West, she couldn't possibly understand how salutary, how important violence had been in claiming this region for settlers. Jackson was no shrinking violet. She returned fire. Uh, she suggested that uh, Byers was a coward. She rebutted his sexism with patriotic nationalism. The bloodshed after Sand Creek, she said, had occupied thousands of federal troops who otherwise might better have spent their time fighting Confederates. Sand Creek hadn't only been a massacre, in other words, it had also detracted from the Union war effort. While she was spot sparring with Byers, Jackson was working on a book about the nation's history of mistreating its indigenous peoples, breaking promises to Native Americans. Century of Dishonor, which was published in 1881, argued that only by overhauling federal Indian policy could the United States be redeemed in the eyes of God. The abolition of slavery wasn't enough for Jackson. Uh, at the time, the Modoc War, the Red River War, and the Great Sioux War, as it was being called, including what was then known as the Custer Massacre at the Little Bighorn, all of these events had recently taken place, and there were, at the time, a number of officials in the Department of the Interior who were eager to embrace Helen Hunt Jackson's calls for reform. But even as the climate surrounding federal tribal relations was shifting, John Shivington's perspective on Sand Creek still had a number of adherents, especially in the West, including editors at the Gunnison Democrat, a newspaper on the western slope of Colorado, uh, who, while Jackson was finishing the writing for Century of Dishonor, called for, quote, another Sand Creek, in this instance to wipe out the Utes in the aftermath of the Meeker Massacre. <clears throat> George Bent, who I mentioned earlier, was infuriated by these sorts of sentiments. Bent was an avid consumer of print media. He took a number of newspapers and also read Western history that was being produced at the time uh, and early anthropology. He was the son of the Borderlands trade tycoon William Bent and uh, Owl Woman, uh, his Cheyenne wife. Bent decided around this time that he needed to weigh in on what had happened at Sand Creek. He'd been wounded there, but had survived. Okay. Yeah, I do have an image of him. He's shown here with his wife, Magpie. Uh, in the aftermath of Sand Creek, he devoted himself to preserving uh, both the history and memory of what happened there. Now, context, again, as ever for historians, matters a great deal. Near the turn of the 20th century, Frederick Jackson Turner, of course, was at the Chicago World's Fair, mourning the closing of the frontier. Conservationists were warning of the impending extinction of the bison, as well as the tribal peoples who depended on those animals for survival, and readers were consuming piles of dime novels about the West. This one actually, I think, cost five cents, so it's actually not a dime novel. 
Uh, it's not particularly accurate. This is the second time I've shown this slide, and I meant to swap it out. Uh, bad historian, I apologize. Um, all of which is to say that the West, both in popular culture and also public policy, was at the center of a variety of different debates about the future of the United States. And George Bent worried that Native people had no voice in those discussions. And so he began relating tribal history first to George Bird Grinnell, one of the founders of the field of professional anthropology, then to James Mooney, a renowned Smithsonian ethnographer, and then finally to George Hyde, a relatively obscure historian, or at least obscure enough that I can't find a picture of him. It's because historians are so shy and retiring. Uh, Bent actually had fascinating things to say about Grinnell and Mooney and about why he ended up working with Hyde. He said that Grinnell never credited his native informants, which is absolutely right, uh, Bent gave Grinnell immense amounts of information and, and received almost no credit uh, for that work. Uh, he said that James Mooney uh, was willing to credit the people that he worked with, that, that, Moody, Mo that Mooney was mad. He thought Mooney was a little bit nuts, which I think is actually kind of fair. Um, and so he ended up uh, working closely um, with, as I said, Hyde. In 1906, Bent and Hyde published articles in a magazine called, fittingly enough, The Frontier. These articles debunked John Shivington's Sand Creek story. Bent acknowledged that he had fought with the Confederacy, he said straight away that he had fought with uh, Southerners during the Civil War, but he mocked the idea uh, that there had been any kind of a rebel plot, uh, those are his words, to try and get Colorado's uh, native peoples to ally um, with the Confederacy. Uh, he explained that the Kiowas and the Comanches were, uh, quote, inveterate foes of Texas, end quote. In other words, they didn't want to fight on the same side as Texans. And he explained that Arapahoes and Cheyennes had no real love for the Union, but that they didn't want to fight with uh, Comanches and Kiowas. Uh, he said that Native peoples in Colorado were too badly divided by their own internal diplomacy, and it was only Sand Creek that brought them together, he explained. Turning the massacre itself, Bent related details of Shivington's betrayal of the peace chiefs, of a white flag that had flown over uh, Black Kettle's Lodge, signaling to the onrushing Colorado troops that this was a peace camp, uh, and finally of those troops' butchery of the bodies uh, of Arapahoes and Cheyennes. In the end, George Bent understood the Civil War not as a war of liberation, but as a war of empire. And so he concluded, and this was the most damning thing that he had to say about John Shivington, that Shivington had wrought with Sand Creek the very thing that he had always claimed to have prevented, and that was a conflict that threatened, if only briefly, uh, the process of white settlement in the American West. Once again, these sorts of charges about Sand Creek infuriated Westerners, particularly in Colorado, in this case including John Shivington's surviving men. Uh, this is uh, Jacob Downing. Uh, Downing resented the idea that his comrades had somehow sullied their otherwise noble service during the Civil War uh, with what had happened at Sand Creek. He wrote into the Denver Times suggesting that Bent was an unreliable narrator. Bent was, quote, a cutthroat and thief, a liar and scoundrel, but worst of all, a half-breed, end quote. Uh, Downing then devoted the rest of his life to embedding John Shivington's Sand Creek story uh, in a Civil War narrative that heritage groups were constructing around the United States at that time, work that culminated in Colorado with the opening, with the unveiling of a memorial in Denver on the state capitol steps in 1909. That monument featured a plaque on its base cataloging the battles and engagements in which Coloradans had fought during the war. Sand Creek, as you may be able to see, this is a bit grainy, but Sand Creek was included on this honor roll. Now at the time, veterans of the Civil War were nearing the end of their lives, and so they were keen to shape how future generations would remember that conflict. 
uh, there was a, a, a kind of a mania for memorialization that swept the United States. Archives acquired document collections, authors published piles and piles and piles of regimental histories, uh, and cities unveiled uh, these sorts of monuments and memorials. Um, these efforts often recounted a, a reconciliationist story of the Civil War, the conflict's root causes, the struggle over slavery, over federal authority and citizenship, and over the right to shape an emerging American empire in the trans-Mississippi West, all of these things could be set aside in service of an amicable reunion between North and South, which is to say that sometimes upholding patriotic orthodoxy requires collective amnesia rather than remembrance. At the statue's dedication in Denver, organizers stitched together uh, themes of national unity and regional pride, seamlessly integrating visions of empire and liberty. General Irving Hale, who'd gained fame during the Spanish-American War and who later helped to found the organization Veterans of Foreign Wars, spoke at this ceremony and celebrated the Civil War for, quote, making freedom universal for all Americans, a war of liberation. Uh, Hale's remarks, of course, ignored the conflict's impact on Native peoples, including the Arapahoes and Cheyennes and Sand Creek. The memorial sponsors had effectively smoothed away the rough, the rough edges of the massacre and cast John Shivington's stories of Sand Creek in bronze. Now I'm going to jump forward less than half a century to 1950, when Coloradans began working against a very different political backdrop, starting to segregate memories of Sand Creek from those of the Civil War, and associating this bloodshed exclusively with the process of westward expansion. On August 6, 1950, the state of Colorado unveiled two historic markers, the first of those was a marble slab that sat atop a rise pictured here. For the remainder of my talk, when I mention the monument overlook, this is what I mean. This is the monument overlook. The first of these, again, a marble slab sat atop this monument overlook. It echoed John Shivington. It read, you can see here, Sand Creek Battleground. The second, though, the second of these memorials was an obelisk sponsored by the State Historical Society, and that one included a mixed message, which I'm, I'm afraid you can't read here. This one's no longer extant. No one knows where this is. <laughs> this thing must have weighed hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pounds. It was taller than me, apparently, and it's simply gone. No one, no one knows what happened to this. So I've never seen a picture. I've only seen the text, uh, which you'll have to trust me, read in part, quote, Sand Creek Battle or Massacre. End quote. Uh, it went on to label this bloodletting, quote, a regrettable tragedy of the conquest of the West, end quote. This was an equivocal interpretation born of the need to placate donors to the historical society and also local people in Kiowa County who didn't relish, well, who still don't relish being told that they had a massacre site in their backyard. Leroy Hafen at the time was Colorado's chief historian. He oversaw these twin dedication ceremonies. He noted of Sand Creek, quote, some have called it a battle while others have labeled it a massacre, end quote. He then tried to duck that fight entirely. He described the violence as, quote, a tragic engagement, an inevitable outgrowth of contact between the incompatible cultures of red and white men, end quote. In this way, he first of all obscured responsibility for what happened at the massacre. It was inevitable, after all. And he also divorced it from its Civil War context. This made sense during the Cold War. At the time, federal authorities were drumming up support for internationalism in the United States by encouraging people in this country to recall the Civil War as an emblem of the nation's commitment to freedom. Sand Creek, which was being bathed in increasingly ambiguous light in these years, again, battle or massacre, didn't fit with this vision of the Civil War as an unalloyed good war. Flashing forward again, uh, by the 1960s now, there were more changes in the nation's cultural 
and political climate, changes that seeded the ground for yet another reappraisal of Sand Creek. Late in the decade, a group of tribal activists formed AIM, the American Indian Movement, and a year later, in 1969, some of that organization's members helped to take over Alcatraz Island in San Francisco Bay, signaling what some people described as the arrival of red power on the national stage. Coincidentally, a week before the Alcatraz occupation began, an investigative reporter and journalist named Seymour Hirsch broke the story of atrocities committed by United States troops in the Vietnamese hamlet of My Lai. And so in 1970, when an author named D. Brown published a book titled Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement, was maintaining a steady focus on issues of racial inequality in the United States. Many people in this country were part of the so-called New Age. They were fascinated by traditional indigenous cultures, or at least what they thought were traditional indigenous cultures as they appropriated them. And finally, people in the United States had once again confronted the capacity of US soldiers sometimes to slaughter innocent civilians. D. Brown's book was written at the right time. It found an audience eager to learn more about Native peoples and keen to embrace critiques of American militarism and racism. For much of his adult life, D. Brown worked at the University of Illinois Library, but at night he wrote books, more than 20 books, which makes me want to weep. Uh, <laughs> one of those books, again, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, was a history of the American West through the eyes of its dispossessed tribal peoples. Of his authorial voice, D. Brown said, quote, I'm a very old Indian and I'm remembering the past. Again, speaking of appropriation and cultural positioning, uh, those memories, leaving that aside for the moment, um, included Sand Creek, for which D. Brown adopted a narrative arc and an interpretive frame very similar to Silas Sewell's, Helen Hunt Jackson's, and George Bent's. He focused on the white flag flying over Black Kettle's Lodge, on Chief White Antelope here on your left, falling in a hail of bullets as he sang his death song, and on John Shivington's men slicing the genitalia from their victims. Professional historians, for the most part, didn't think very much of D. Brown's book. They said that he had set aside scholarly balance, that he'd written a polemic, he hadn't properly interrogated his Native American sources, and that he had distorted evidence and made errors of fact. Reviewers outside the Academy, though, loved the book. The New York Times described Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee as, quote, both impossible to read and impossible to put down. The book buying public agreed. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee spent more than a year on the New York Times bestseller list and has, in the year since, sold more than five million copies. Those are good sales. Um, it also had a real influence on a rising generation of scholars including uh, self-styled New Western historians. Uh, one of their ranks, a man named Paul Hutton, has said of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, we all went to bed thinking one way about the Indian Wars and Indians, and we woke up the next morning after that book was published, and we never thought the same way again. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee's impact could still be felt in 1998, when Congress created or excuse me, when Congress passed the legislation that would create the Sand Creek historic site. You see the creek bottom here with cottonwoods growing in it. Uh, but even then, even in 1998, even after nearly a century and a half of struggles over how to remember this event, the Park Service discovered that there were enduring questions surrounding this violence that remained unanswered. Then the Park Service learned of a new question that caught people within it off guard. That was where precisely had Sand Creek taken place? It turned out that before this event could be memorialized, it first had to be found, or so the Park Service thought. Uh, the search that ensued, the search for the Sand Creek killing field, uh, became contentious when epistemological, that's jargony, uh, when, when um, disputes over how people uh, uh, generate knowledge 
divided the, the, the individuals who were looking for the site, the various constituencies. The descendants of Sand Creek's victims typically, but not always, based their understanding of this episode's history and geography on what they described as traditional tribal methods, uh, also on oral histories and on written records, including stories and maps produced by George Bent around the turn of the 20th century. An image of one of, those uh, one of those maps. For decades leading up to 1998, the Sand Creek descendants had used Bent's maps and his writings as a kind of guide. They had made pilgrimages annually to a spot near the Monument Overlook that I showed you earlier, where they performed ceremonies, venerated the memories of their ancestors. Now the Park Service, by contrast, tried to solve the mystery of the Sand Creek uh, field location by looking to other materials especially records that were produced by troops who had fought there. And then by consulting a map penned by a soldier, a soldier named Samuel Bonsall, who visited the Sand Creek site in the years after the massacre with William Tecumseh Sherman, who then was in charge of the United States military's forces in the West. Using this map, the Bonsall map, which you might be able to see here, includes a notation saying Shivington's Massacre, as it was known at the time, it was Shivington's Massacre, not the federal government's massacre, not the United States Army's massacre. Using this notation of Shivington's Massacre, and then annotations along the side of this strip map, the Park Service believed that it located the precise location, not just where the Sand Creek slaughter had taken place, but where Black Kettle's people had camped in the run-up to this event. The Park Service then sent uh, archaeologists into the field. Those archaeologists discovered a huge band of artifacts. They unearthed this which seemed to confirm the Park Service's hypothesis that the massacre had taken place about three-fifths of a mile upstream from the traditional site or the Monument Overlook, where it says existing marker, this is the Monument Overlook, this is the bend in Sand Creek that you'll see a moment, in a moment on George Bent's maps. This is that plume of artifacts that I mentioned a moment ago, and a second concentration of artifacts located even further upstream. Many of the Sand Creek descendants were enraged by these findings. The Park Service, they said, was relying on sources that were produced by Sand Creek's perpetrators rather than its victims. They pointed to George Bent's maps, insisting that Bent, again a Cheyenne survivor of the massacre, had placed Black Kettle's village inside a crook of Sand Creek. I'll show you a, a, a close-up of this in a moment, but it says Black Kettle's Camp, number two, on the legend, and this is that bend in Sand Creek that I showed you a moment ago. Here's that close-up. They then produced their own map of the massacre site, including Black Kettle's village, which they located precisely where they said George Bent had drawn it nearly a century earlier. So on your right, you see the National Park Service's map with an Indian village, as they described it, located upstream from the Monument Overlook. And then on your left, you see the Southern Cheyenne, Southern Arapaho, Northern Cheyenne map, one tribe conspicuously absent there, uh, their map of the location of the Sand Creek Massacre site, and on and on and on. The Park, the Park Service was caught off guard by this dispute over competing cartographies, but eventually found its footing and floated a compromise, a site with boundaries that were expansive enough to encompass a variety of different interpretations of where Sand Creek had taken place. These are the boundaries of the park, the monument overlook, the site of that artifact plume, the site of the second concentration of artifacts a historic site that was big enough to include everybody's stories of what had happened at Sand Creek. After a number of additional twists and turns, including a casino corporation stepping in to broker a deal that secured the most important piece of property for this memorial, 
the NPS, the Park Service, was finally ready to cut the ribbon on the Sand Creek Nas National Historic Site, all of which leads back to April 28, 2007, when the first unit of the National Park System to label American soldiers perpetrators rather than heroes or victims opened its doors. Now the site's name answered the question of what Sand Creek would be called, but how to interpret the massacre remained unresolved, and that's where I'm going to conclude. The United States has just celebrated the Civil War and Sand Creek sesquicentennials. This site, the Sand Creek Massacre National Historic Site, has challenged visitors because the Park Service, rather than asking them again whether this bloodshed was a battle or a massacre, seems to have answered that question definitively. I say this because the stories that most people in this country tell themselves about the Civil War suggest that President Lincoln died so that the United States might be reborn, redeemed for having liberated the South's four million slaves. This is a resurrection story that meshes neatly with Christian narratives of catharsis through suffering. And in this way, American memory transfigures the Civil War's history of violence into one of virtue, its tragedies into triumphs. But Sand Creek, again, depicted as a massacre at this historic site, bucks the redemptive currents that run through most national historic sites. This site indicts characters usually cast as heroes in the American imagination. Citizen soldiers, overland pioneers and settlers, and union officials. This site reflects a darker vision of the Civil War's causes and its consequences. Expansion into the West touched off the war that helped to uh, destroy the institution of slavery, yes, but also other wars with the Plains tribes that left behind no simple lessons for federal commemorators intent on bending public memory to nationalist ends. In the end, the story of memorializing Sand Creek suggests that history and memory are both malleable, if not always biddle, and that the people of the United States are so various that they, that we, shouldn't be expected to share a single tale of a common past. Sometimes our stories will complement one another, sometimes they're going to clash. Depending on who tells it, for example, the story of Sand Creek might recount a civil war that midwifed, in President Lincoln's words, a new birth of freedom, but also a conflict that delivered to the nation the Indian Wars. This was a moment of national redemption for some, but of dispossession and subjugation for others. It was a war both of liberation and also of empire. The National Park Service of Tribal Descendants will never, I assure you, concur on every element of how to interpret Sand Creek, but they have agreed that this historic site should challenge visitors to grapple with competing narratives of United States history and to struggle with how our past is shot through with painful ironies. I've suggested in this book that I've written that as a result of this, the massacre may no longer be misplaced, at least in the landscape of national memory. Thank you. Any more Great, thanks very much. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, back to geography, I was wondering if the kind of remoteness of the site has anything to do with um, a sort of a, a first site for this kind of reinterpretation of history. I mean, could this site exist in an urban setting like Minneapolis or something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, yes to the first part. I'm going to punt on the second part, at least for right now. Uh, the remoteness is, is, I think, actually a critical part of why it was possible to reinterpret Sand Creek in this way. It is truly out of the way. It's, it's, it's in the, you go to the middle of nowhere and then you have to keep going, right? You, you drive to eastern Colorado to Kiowa County, 
and then you have to drive another 25 minutes on uh, county roads, and then you get to an old oil road that's a dirt road, uh, and you have to destroy the undercarriage of your car if you really want to get there. Um, and there's no question that the Park Service thought that this was a relatively safe place to put this kind of a memorial. Having said that, I don't think that that was the really important reason why this happened. The really critical reason why this happened was that Ben Nighthorse Campbell is Northern Cheyenne, and he was on the relevant Senate committees, and he wanted to memorialize Sand Creek as a kind of capstone to his career. Uh, it's always difficult to know with Senator Campbell, um, well, it's always hard to know how much truth there is. I mean, he's, he's an extraordinary narrator of his own story. I mean, as are we all, right? Uh, but he's a, a really able politician, so there's a lot of layers there. But I take him at his word on this one because there are a lot of people who have said that for decades he talked about doing this. And so I, I think that was the really critical issue, is that he was able to say to people in the National Park Service, I control the purse strings based on the committees on which I sit in the Senate, and I want you to do this. And then he got wind that, that a, a rancher wanted to sell his property, and, and Campbell, who refused to acquire land uh, other than uh, from willing sellers, um, this offered him the opportunity to, to, to make this happen. So I do think it matters, but I don't think it was the critical trigger. Well, then there is the there is the commemoration of Sand Creek Massacre in at least the attempt to do so in an urban setting in Denver uh, at the museum. So there is a there is the very very remote site landscape site National Park Service, and then there is this urban building smack dab in the middle of Denver, a, a white institution, the History of Colorado, that then tries to do its own memorialization of the. And, and fails, right? They, uh, so fails epically, epically, as the kids say. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, 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 but I'm so trying to leave open the possibility that, that interpreting Fort Snelling uh, in a really, really complicated um, and potentially extraordinarily contentious way, that, that, that that's open to people. Uh, because I think it is. Uh, so I'm now I'm going to unpunt, okay? Um, <laughs> The reason that the, that the uh, exhibit, and, and the backstory of this is that History Colorado tries to uh, have an exhibit about Sand Creek, and has to, in fact they do, put up an exhibit and then they have to take that exhibit down, but th that exhibit doesn't fail because there's, because there's pressure from the community in Denver. That exhibit fails because History Colorado is a settler colonial institution that keeps on behaving in that way and it doesn't consult with the relevant tribes. And I have friends who work there and so I don't I don't want to I don't want to kick them while they're down because a bunch of them just got laid off. They they've just reorganized. And so I it, I really am sort of reluctant to to be too harsh, but in this instance the problem wasn't that there were a bunch of neo shivingtonites running around Denver saying, you can't call Sand Creek a massacre. It was that the relevant tribes said, you can't put up an exhibit without talking to us first. Mm -hmm. and, and so again, if there are lessons here for people who are interested in doing something like this in uh, uh, an urban setting like Minneapolis or elsewhere, it's make sure that you're working with the right constituencies and observing proper tribal protocols. Mm -hmm. What uh, the, the Park Service presentation at the site, how complex is that? Do they recognize a difference of opinion? Uh, that's a great question. It's The site is, at this point, still very lightly interpreted, right? We're, we're almost, uh, well, we're, we're eight, eight plus years out from the opening, from this ribbon cutting ceremony that I talked about. And there are very, very few historic markers there. Uh, and there's a, 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 a temporary visitor center, which is going to become permanent, right? Because these are the times in which we live. There's no funding to, to put a, a real visitor center there. 
Uh, in terms of the historic markers that are there, they are incredibly, surprisingly hard hitting. Um, they, they talk at length about the atrocities committed by John Shivington's troops. They reproduce letters from Silas Sewell and other officers who were there, Joseph Kramer, who I didn't mention in my talk. The Park Service hasn't left open uh, to visitors, or the Park Service hasn't invited visitors to revisit this question of where the massacre took place. Instead, what it's done is put all of its interpretation on the monument overlook. And, and the reason for that is that the, the site superintendent uh, simply decided that that was fine with her. She, it, the, the, the people who were pushing this notion that Black Kettle's village was actually located upstream at that artifact plume, I'm not going to try and scroll back to the slide, I'm hoping you'll remember. Those people uh, were historians, um, he says with some shame, uh, and archaeologists. Um, and the current site superintendent is an anthropologist who got her start working in the Navajo Nation in cultural resources. And she's very, very comfortable allowing the affected tribes to make these decisions about where they want to place uh, these interpretive markers. The other thing that's at the site I should note, uh, and this was a, a major motivating factor for the descendants, is a tribal cemetery. Uh, where And, and I, I, I can't speak about these issues, I, I apologize, but I, they're not mine to talk about, but where there have been, uh, where, where remains have been repatriated and then buried. Um, and again, it's not from, but the, I can say to you that that cemetery is there, and, and so uh, that's closed to the public, and, which is, a, a, again, really an extraordinarily important part of this site for the descendants, because this is a federal site that has an exclusively indigenous space located on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was, as I say, one of the reasons that uh, the affected tribes, even when they were very frustrated in their interactions with the Park Service, they, they remained involved in this process. Thank you, it's so fascinating. And when you're talking about the question of the terminology, um, the, the um, battle or quote, massacre on the other, or, and then this other question, it reminded me, so, I take a class to Snelling every year, and we were just there two weeks ago, so last week we had the discussion of it, and one of the things that they noticed at the state park, not at the historic site, there's a marker and a nice illustration, the famous picture, of the, of the, of the camp, which it defines as a concentration asterisk camp. Then at the bottom it says, this term has been proposed by the American Indian community mm -hmm. to replace the term internment. What's interesting to me, is that I read this saying, oh, that's interesting, they want to evoke the tensions around this for the viewer, and my students were saying that's way naive. <laughs> You're way naive, Professor Chang. What they're trying to do is not piss off more conservative visitors than you for using the word concentration for camp, saying it's a bunch of Indians that want to use this word, oh. not us in the National Park Service, so don't call me and be mad. <laughs> and so, with, with, so it kind of questions like, there's this intellectual sophistication of tracing the definition of an event which you're doing, which I'm interested in, and then there's people who wanted this to be named, and for legitimate reasons, right? I was like, so I had to take my hats off to my students. I said, yeah, I think I might be naive on this one, you know? I'm so I just want to speak to that tension and, and where, what you feel about that, and love to hear your ideas. So um, the, the uh, Civil War Memorial in Colorado, the one on the state capitol steps that I showed you, the, the, the uh, soldier on foot carrying his rifle, um, that's been reinterpreted. Uh, it, there, there was talk uh, of, of erasing Sand Creek, of, of, of re-grinding that plaque and, and putting a new coat of, 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 of putting a new patina on it so that it would look like it had been there for an appropriate amount of time, but without Sand Creek there. And the, uh, the sh I want to make sure I'm getting this right. Yeah, the Cheyenne, Northern and Southern descendants groups rejected that. Mm -hmm. and said, uh, don't simply erase Sand Creek, please leave it there, but reinterpret it with a plaque nearby. Mm -hmm. And so, I love that solution as a historian, mm -hmm. right? I, I, the more complexity in the landscape that there can be, mm 
the happier I am as a scholar. But I recognize that with that complexity comes all sorts of opportunity for misunderstanding. And it's possible, for example, for people simply not to see the reinterpretation and to say, oh, Sand Creek, there it is, yep. That was a terrific thing. Goes along with Glorietta Pass, and I forget the name of all the other engagements. Uh, and so I don't know how to resolve that tension other than as a scholar and say that I like it. I want more tension. I want you to be able to say, this means X, and then your students to say to you, no, it doesn't, professor. You're wrong. I, I think that kind of discussion is when memorials function at their best. I don't think memorials, my own personal, I, I'm not, now hold on a second, I'm speaking as Ari, right? I'm not speaking as some sort of an expert on memorials. This is not very well considered. Nothing I say is well considered, but this is less <laughs> well considered than a lot of what I've said. I don't think memorials are particularly effective as, as helping people heal. I, I, I don't have much sense that people heal as a result of, 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 of visiting memorials. I think what memorials do is they help people remember, they spur conversation. And, and usually, well, depending on what you're remembering, it's very painful. Even, even happy memories are often bittersweet. And so, again, I, I'm all for it. I'm not a card-carrying historian, so I should uh, be cautious before venturing into these waters. But I just do want to share that for much of the last five years plus, I've spent time with some Dakota people thinking about the confluence of the Dote area. One of our now gone elders, one of their elders, who's now gone, spent time for four years prior to the sesquicentennial in 2012. Uh, she's from Fort Texas. She went out into the Dakota diaspora bringing people back here annually for that. And she, after a year or so, stopped calling the site in question here a concentration camp because she could see reading the Dakota and white and uh, non-Dakota Native people she was working with, that that was something that got in the way of talking about what the place meant. She went back to talking about it as an internment camp because it allowed her conversations to go more quickly into where she wanted them to go. So the complexity of who is calling it what, in what context, I think is another very great uh, difficulty and a great uh, complicating factor in thinking about these things that we do have to think about. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting to me, and I, I, both what David was saying and what you just said is, my own associations of internment camps in, in the landscape of American hits, it's not, necessarily more positive mm -hmm. than concentration camp. I mean, I'm not sure, I guess that concentration camp has the association of death camp for most people because they're not differentiating and, and so it's part of the, the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But that's not, in my own mind, I think of a concentration camp as being concentration camp. Right. I, I tend actually to think of the Trail of Tears. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the concentration of, of the Cherokees mm -hmm. before they, but I, I don't know. But I mean, speaking to the point of, 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 of this question of complexity, I, I was saying to Jeannie earlier, I, you know, my, my own way of handling all of these issues is, it's not my history. I, the descendants get to name these things in the way that they want to. Where it gets really complex is when they're arguing with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in those moments, I just sort of sit there and, you know, steeple my fingers uh, like Dee Brown in that picture. Um, and, and, and try and stay out of the way. Uh, which, you know, for a participant observer, that's a horrible answer, right? But historian, not an anthropologist. Um, I would like to ask you also about um, other kind of uh, national parks, like Yellowstone yep. or, you know, or, um, you know, Death studies and other, other places that you know there are visitor centers you go there and you learn about the natural history and then those uh, you know, those exhibits involve sometimes in a way of life you know, done by you know, Native American people but they're always um, 
the people's history were described without any kind of violence or politics behind them. So if, if you just look at the history of those national parks, you, know, you assume that there was a very peaceful transition from Native American to Europeans. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering about how you know, you know, those narratives definitely need to be changed. And I was wondering about what a National Park Service is thinking about those mm -hmm. things. Uh, there are, as you probably know, a, a group of historians who have written about this issue not as a, a, a fight over memory, but have written about the, the specific episodes of dispossession that led to the creation of the national parks. So, was it Mark Spence wrote Dispossessing the Wilderness, and Carl Jacoby wrote Crimes Against Nature, and Louis Warren wrote The Hunter's Game, and uh, I'm trying to think of others, but drawing a blank right now. Um, so that, that history is out there, and the Park Service uh, aggressively ignores it. Um, and there have been several different initiatives to try and have the Park Service reinterpret its early history, mm -hmm. and the NPS isn't particularly interested in doing that. What the NPS has done in a couple of its parks, Rocky Mountain, Glacier, I should say it's more than a couple. It's Rocky Mountain Glacier, and I'm forgetting a third. Oh, uh, Teton Yellowstone um, are the ones that I know about, and there may be others as well, is, is they've at least put up exhibits suggesting that Native people still exist. Uh, so rather than treating Native people as historical artifacts and, and suggesting that they vanished, uh, they have some discussion of where those tribe, where those peoples are now. The people who were, but again, that doesn't extend back to a reinterpretation of the early history. So I suspect it'll happen, I'm an optimist, um, but it hasn't been easy. And right now, the Park Service has so little money, particularly uh, for history, all of its money is going toward deferred maintenance mm -hmm. and, and some cultural resources preservation that it's not likely to happen anytime soon. I was, uh, I, I appreciated your comment about uh, the palliative failure of memorials, uh, usually to this notion of, I don't know where this comes from really, it's something else to, to be debated I think historically, where do, why do we think Doing these is going to be healing, and what? How do we define healing? And all those things. But I also, I would, I would agree and then disagree with you that memorials are done not for healing, but for remembering. Because I, it seems like they're done more often for forgetting. I mean, it's sort of purposeful forgetting. Let's do this memorial and tell you that this is the way things happen, and leave out all the stuff that we don't want you to remember, like the Oklahoma City memorial, you know, which is, which leaves out um, in the memorial itself the whole context of right-wing extremism. Um, it's, it just sort of happened. It was like, a, like an earthquake or something happened in Oklahoma City. It wasn't committed by somebody. Um, and there's all sorts of examples of, I just went to the bonfire memorial at Texas A&M mm -hmm. University. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you would never know what happened there if you go to this huge memorial. It's just a bunch of people died, and isn't that sad? That's what the memorial is about. So let's forget everything else. Let's forget about agency. Uh, let's forget about idiocy. I know all of these things. Uh, let's just remember sad students who died. I mean, overwhelmingly, memorials are produced by people who have power, and people who have power right. like the status quo. Right. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, sometimes I talk to my students about why I'm not a radical anymore, and the answer is as simple as I have tenure. Right. I don't, I don't actually want to see the system burn down right now because I have a mortgage to pay. Um, and I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I, like, I wish it were true, but I, my politics, I'm not actually any more conservative. I, I just, they, they've shifted though. And so this is true of people who design memorials, but what, and I don't think it's unique to this story, but I think it's unusual in the Sand Creek story, and I, and I act, stop and take a step back and see what I mean. First of all, 
I think that what happened in this story is that the descendants actually had real power. And so that shifted the playing field of memorialization in important ways. This project could not go forward without the okay of tribal peoples who have, in this instance at least, I can't speak universally, but in this instance had absolutely no interest in propping up mm -hmm. images of a benign federal authority. That, that just wasn't part of their program at all. Now, I'm, I'm tempted, and I, I will, though again, I'm, I'm, you can hear me being cautious, I'm actually going back to Fort Snelling and the, maybe the first question, I'm optimistic that that will almost always be true when memorials involving tribal peoples, when memorialization involving tribal peoples take place. I, I actually think that tribal peoples provide a, a really important counterweight mm -hmm. to the sort of nationalizing vision of these sorts of memorials and, and monuments and other. And so that's not something I've said in my book. I'm not ready to defend it right now. But again, I, I do think this notion of, of pluralistic memorialization, and when you bring different voices into the conversation, if you bring the voices of tribal people into the conversation, as a general rule, the tribal peoples that I work with, the tribal people that I know, aren't particularly interested in, in, in the status quo. They want to see change, and they want these sorts of monuments and memorials to be catalysts for change. And so, again, if, if, if you want sort of a hopeful message out of this, maybe that's it. But it also might just be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you said a little bit about why, why this project, why you started, and why you did it. <laughs> um, I'm, it's a really long answer, which I'm going to try. I'm just trying to think about how to give it in a way that's not going to drive people crazy. Uh, I went to graduate school to write about Native people uh, in the Civil War. The person who I went to study with died in my first semester of my first year, and so I wrote one essay for, for him, uh, and then had to find something else to do because there was nobody else who was willing to, to allow me to write what I wanted to write. Um, so I got sidetracked and wrote a book about New Orleans and became a, a, a wannabe environmental historian for a little while. And then we, my family and I moved back to, uh, not moved back, we moved to Denver. Um, and I had a, a little kid uh, and I wanted to do a project that was gonna be simple and local. <laughs> Oops. Um, <laughs> it was neither. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I drove to Lame Deer, Montana uh, for what I thought were going to be, you know, 24-hour, 48-hour visits that turned into a week or, in some cases, two. Uh, but, I mean, the shortest answer I can give is I doubled back to this question of Native people in, in the era of the Civil War. Because for me, again, we were talking about this earlier, it's, it's, it's a critical story that I think that I don't want to give myself very much credit at all. I think historians actually know this story, but it, people haven't written about it very often. And so there's, there's sort of a gap where uh, Indian peoples drop out of the meta-narrative of United States history. And when they drop out sort of depends on, on, on which historian you're talking about. But certainly they're, they're gone by the United States-Mexican War. Right, by the end of that, uh, so, so giving Pekka, Pekka Hamelin and lots of credit for his revisionist history and Brian DeLay lots of credit which they deserve, let's say that people now are grappling with the story of Comancheria, but then they disappear again until Wounded Knee. Uh, and from my perspective, and, and again, this is a Civil War historian talking, right, so take it with a grain of salt, but from my perspective, the Civil War is the hinge event in the meta narrative of United States history. And if indigenous people aren't part of that story, we are missing something absolutely critical 
about the American experience. And so that's why I want to do this, that's why I keep doing this kind of work, because I, I, I wrote this book and, as Jeannie said, it did improbably did remarkably well, right? I was absolutely convinced that this book would be not ignored, but that it would, you know, people would, would think it was weird, which it is, it's a super weird book. Uh, and that, as a number of people have, they'd say it wasn't really history, which maybe it isn't, I don't know. Uh, but I didn't think it was going to win a bunch of prizes. Um, and so maybe people will pay attention to the central argument in the book. I don't know. But I don't actually think the book made the argument as well as it needs to be made. So I, I, I went into this hoping that I was going to make this argument about the centrality of indigenous people in the story of the United States Civil War. But I don't think that Sand Creek tells that story as well as it can be told, which is why I'm writing this new book, which has a chapter about the Dakota War and, and, and others. And so, I mean, that's again, it's a long answer and not a particularly adequate one, and it doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of how I wrote the book and what an immense mess it was and, you know, how depressed I got while I was writing it and how lousy I am at writing and, you know, and on and on and on. But it at least gives you some sense of what motivated me to write it. Yeah. Okay. Are there any last questions? Well, I want to thank you very much for coming and let's get to the